Good day and welcome. My name is Matthew Cafiero and I'm going to be talking about the challenge uh, presented by COVID-19 to study abroad programs with an emphasis on administrative, practical, and legal implications for study abroad programs in a post-pandemic global marketplace. What makes this presentation's focus a little unusual is that the primary challenges are not strictly legislative or legal, but they are administrative, bureaucratic, and I will go into some detail uh, over the next couple minutes to explain what I mean by that. Just a quick side note, I am currently involved in a study abroad program which has been impacted by the COVID-19 epidemic. As part of Northeastern's International Field Study Experience, uh, I have been working with uh, a, a number of fellow classmates in advising the British consulate in Boston uh, concerning opportunities for offshore wind power uh, in the American Northeast. So I have some experience and I'm going to talk about how the past can inform the future, specifically that even though the COVID-19 pandemic is unique, there are lessons that we can draw uh, from previous pandemics this century. Uh, and those would be SARS in 2003 and H1N1PDM09, uh, better known as the variant swine flu from 2009. Before I proceed, a very brief agenda. Uh, first, I'm going to give a quick overview of the SARS pandemic from 2003, as many of my classmates uh, will not well remember that uh, or will be uh, fuzzy on some of the details. I will contrast that one with the H1M1 breakout in North America in 2009, and then we'll explore how both of these uh, compare to COVID-19 and we will extrapolate some lessons that we can learn informed by these past experiences. The first pandemic of the 21st century was the SARS outbreak uh, in 2003. Uh, SARS is a coronavirus uh, like COVID-19 and like COVID, uh, it originated in China, but it saw international spread that defeated local measures at containment. Um, the perceived impact was greater than the infection and death rates. Although SARS is contagious, or excuse me, was contagious and did have a substantially higher mortality rate than similar respiratory ailments like standard influenza, it was more frightening in its potential than in its actuality. Uh, a vaccine was developed, um, but the vaccine development was a complex process and came very late in, in the outbreak. By the time the vaccine had been developed and deployed, the outbreak had largely burned out uh, in most of the Pacific Rim nations where it had been spreading. The main thing that we can take away from SARS is that there were practical rather than legal issues. Um, visas were not pulled, uh, although programs were shortened or, or canceled by their uh, sponsoring institutions, there were no legislative or administrative uh, changes requiring that. And there were a number of travel restrictions which did impact uh, SAPs uh, quite heavily. In this photo, you can see residents of Hong Kong riding public transit, uh, public transportation during the SARS outbreak. Um, you'll notice familiar precautions, the use of masks, um, although there is no emphasis obviously on social distancing. The main impacts of SARS, uh, one, were regional. 
although there was a fairly substantial outbreak in t the city of Toronto in Canada, and there were isolated cases largely from people who had traveled from infection hotspots, the epicenter of the virus was in China and throughout the Pacific Rim. Uh, Japan, uh, Cambodia, Vietnam, uh, South Korea. There were reports from North Korea, although their press is not as forthcoming. Um, Summers was also short term. Uh, it first arose in 2002, was formerly uh, classified as a pandemic virus in 2003, and by the end of 2003, it had been contained. Uh, other than a brief outbreak in a lab in China that was studying the virus in 2004, there have been no cases of SARS uh, virus uh, in the wild, if you will, since the 2003 outbreak. And its primary impacts were financial and more importantly, psychological. It was scary. It was uh, an element of uncertainty um, following the, the uh, change in millennia. Um, and most importantly, it impacted institutions and study abroad programs, not through legal changes, but through changing expectations. And I'll go over some of those in a little more detail when we get to COVID-19. Now, the second pandemic outbreak of the 21st century was a variant of the H1N1 influenza called H1N1 PDM09. Uh, this is a variant of the uh, H1N1 influenza or the swine flu, uh, as it's also known, uh, primarily because it's believed to have originated in commercial uh, pig farms in North America. Because H1N1 PDM09 originated in North America, which at the time uh, had a couple of things going for it, it wound up not being the, the horrible uh, pandemic that some people originally envisioned. Um, when it first arose, there was an idea that this was like SARS, but with the pervasive widespread uh, through society of typical influenza. Um, but a couple good things happened. H1M1 PDM09 is a variant of the H1M1 influenza virus, which has been circulating in uh, the world and especially in North America uh, for several decades. And many older people had residual immunity. What this meant was that um, the most vulnerable populations to, an, to a coronavirus, to an, a respiratory infection uh, that spreads through aerosol dispersal, um, the, the immunocompromised and the elderly, well, the elderly were substantially better protected. A vaccine was again developed near the end of the outbreak. Unfortunately, unlike SARS, H1M1 did not burn out. It was not contained. It continues to spread today, uh, but in a much reduced impact. It is part of the seasonal spread of influenza strains along with type A and type B. So the flu vaccine that you receive every year is actually formulated with an H1M1 uh, preventative component. What these differences between H1M1 PDM09 and SARS meant for study abroad programs um, and for uh, higher education providers in the affected areas, mostly in, in North America, is that it was minimally disruptive. Uh, the United States at that time had a robust healthcare infrastructure. The vaccine uh, was developed that was largely but not 100% effective. And because it was essentially an extremely serious version of influenza and associated pneumonia, uh, it was there were a number of effective treatments. We know how to treat the flu. 
Unlike coronavirus, there were no novel aspects of the infection and treatment. So it was a serious but manageable threat. Campuses did not close down. Uh, there were some institutions that had dormitories or individual programs that were affected, but it did not systemically affect higher education or study abroad programs uh, based in or from the United States. And this brings us to the elephant in the room, COVID-19. Uh, COVID-19 is not the flu. It is substantially different in its reach, its impact, and its pervasiveness. Um, it is a truly global pandemic on a scale not seen with SARS or H1N1, PDM09. Rapid multi-regional spread. It jumped out of Wuhan, China, and before it was well understood and well reported in that context, it had already spread to the Middle East, to Europe, and there were isolated cases in America, uh, in North America, as early as January of 2020, uh, possibly December of, of 2019. Um, most cases in the U.S. can be traced through Europe. So while the U.S. response was focused on China and on uh, a fairly ineffectual travel ban, there was a very slow U.S. response. This was compounded by testing difficulties, the lack of a current vaccine, and most importantly, treatment challenges. The scale and complexity of coronavirus treatment in the U.S. overwhelmed the healthcare infrastructure. Um, New York City especially uh, came very close to a, a tipping point uh, where the daily battle against new infections, demand for ventilators, call for ICU beds, trained doctors and nursing staff, uh, all were stretched to their absolute limits. This is a rapidly evolving and most importantly ongoing crisis. So though I'm going to speak about a post COVID-19 world, we understand that <clears throat> Many of us are still experiencing the first wave or the initial stages of this pandemic. Um, so some of the lessons that we can learn from SARS and H1N1 are built on the optimistic assumption that the world will return to a level of normalcy uh, and that COVID-19 will eventually be contained. And there is emerging evidence uh, from the Pacific Rim, especially from New Zealand, Australia, Tasmania, uh, but also from uh, developed European countries such as uh, Germany, that this is a survivable, containable threat. And here we see our lovely home campus of Northeastern University in Boston. Um, the primary impacts of COVID-19 as they relate to higher education providers and study abroad programs are a slowdown in global travel. Uh, this is the most significant impact on global travel since the brief uh, ban on international flights to and from North America following the 9-11 uh, attacks by Al-Qaeda. Campus and abroad programs have been canceled across the, the region. Um, the region being, in this case, China, North America, uh, Europe. There have also been impacts in Africa, Central and South America. Um, those are emerging. Those the, the are, are less well documented. But... It's not entirely negative. This has forced the maturity of distance learning. Um, being the first pandemic to largely shut down face-to-face -face education uh, in most of the developed, the well-developed world, COVID has had the 
effect of boosting technologies such as Zoom, uh, other uh, asynchronous learning programs and distance learning methodologies. Um, but it has led to most SAPs, including my own, uh, either being canceled or in the case of our IFSE, uh, conversion to a distance learning model. There's a popular quote, it's been attributed to Mark Twain, but uh, there's substantial evidence that it, it, it's uh, of unknown origin about a hundred years after Twain's death, that history does not repeat itself, but it rhymes. The idea that the past can inform our decision making, but it should not mandate our actions. Um, the reason I mention this is that Although COVID-19 is substantially unique in many ways, uh, it does share some commonality with the previous outbreaks that I've mentioned. Um, the image that you're looking at here is of the London Eye and the view uh, of the Thames River. Uh, this is actually taken from Northeastern University's uh, International Field Study Experience brochure for London. Um, and what I want to talk about now is how administrative, bureaucratic, and practical considerations based on our past experience with SARS and H1N1 can be expected to affect study abroad programs in a post-COVID-19 world. All of these assumptions, again, are built on the assumption that the world will reopen, that we will see uh, eventual broad containment. There's a lot of evidence for this, as I've mentioned, that we are already seeing some areas where this is contained. Uh, the United States is not among them. Um, there are people here currently talking, and when I say currently, we're talking 24 June 2020. There are currently people who are addressing a second wave in the United States. Um, except for some isolated areas such as New York City, um, some areas of New Jersey, uh, some areas of Connecticut, uh, the U.S. is not out of its first wave. We do not have broad containment. We had a plateau but have not had uh, a substantial uh, improvement. And some areas such as Texas, where I'm recording this, are actually experiencing record numbers of new infections and deaths on a daily basis. Uh, we are still in the midst of this crisis. With that said, here are the important takeaways, the extrapolated lessons from our previous pandemic experiences. HEPs that want to run study abroad programs must prepare for blended learning from the start. Uh, although that it's unlikely that legal barriers will arise, um, such as it, um, the a, uh, recall of student visas or uh, a, a ban on foreign students, it's substantially likely, and it's already been seen in some cases, that there are administrative and practical obstacles. For example, if you're planning on running a two-week immersion program in Europe, and you're coming from Texas or from Brazil, you may spend those two weeks in quarantine upon your arrival. So travel will be reestablished, but there should be a substantial period of time where moving from an area of substantially different intensity of infection to another area with a different intensity, uh, some uh, located at a different place on the curve, may come with substantial restrictions. And purely practical obstacles, such as flight cancellations, uh, the lack of uh, tourism and accommodation-related resources, 
if hotels, restaurants have not reopened, if museums or other activity uh, centers have not reopened, we should expect to see substantial disruption to SAPs. And again, these are based on national, regional, uh, sometimes down to county or city-based uh, responses to the pandemic. Uh, here in Dallas, Texas, for example, the Dallas Zoo has recently reopened, although they are enforcing 50% occupancy rates and um, mask requirements and social distancing, while the LBJ Presidential Library in Austin is fully reopened, but requires masks and gloves for anyone handling any of their primary source materials. Uh, and they also are doing restricted hours as they do decontamination and deep cleaning of the building and public spaces. We should also expect an increased demand. Following a substantial period of enforced lockdown, of quarantines, of restriction from participation, Although there will be some hesitancy to, to rush into a uncertain situation, there's a large number of, st of people, especially students, uh, college age students, who are going to want to travel, who are going to want to leave home and go somewhere else. And the opportunity to do that with a guided study abroad program as opposed to navigating a post-COVID uh, wild west of, of tourism and travel may be extremely attractive for, uh, for some individuals. This is going to require increased flexibility. The idea that you can sign a contract a year in advance, that you can reserve hotels uh, or uh, university residences, that you can sign binding contracts uh, up to a year or even six months in advance, ignores the possibility of regional flare-ups of second or third waves. So program design will need to be substantially more flexible. This means that we'll also need improved training as study abroad providers will also need uh, to be substantially more flexible. Uh, if a student calls and says, I'm immunocompromised, and although this program is going forward, I don't feel I can safely travel to country X, Y, or Z. Um, how does that impact the possible refund of fees? <coughs> is there a one-size-fits-all? Or are policies going to have to be rewritten with substantially improved flexibility? Training the staff of SAP providers and the uh, higher education providers who are offering these SAPs, it will be critical. And finally, and probably most importantly, preparation for aftercare. It's always been a best practice for study abroad programs that they include a re-entry component, uh, uh, a combination of training and counseling and resources designed to welcome and reintegrate the traveling student back into their home campus. During the H1N1 outbreak, um, this was not a huge consideration, but during SARS in 2003, large numbers of Asian students especially <clears throat> were stuck in quarantine or in uh, stuck by travel restrictions. And one of the studies I cite in my paper noted that over 60% of Chinese students who had been uh, quarantined in Japan during the SARS outbreak required psychological uh, and emotional support resources, including counseling, after their return. They experienced depression, uh, feelings of isolation, uh, resentment, um, even shame, the idea that they were from the country from which this virus had spread uh, and were 
in some cases made to feel responsible uh, through what amounts to bullying. All of these require aftercare and having a substantial commitment to aftercare in place will be critical in a post-COVID-19 environment to deal with possible repercussions of a resurgence of COVID or the next eventual pandemic as these do come uh, in a cyclical fashion. And that cycle appears to be accelerating due to climate change, uh, increased urbanization, population growth, and some other factors. What I hope all of these uh, scenarios have, have, have communicated is that study abroad programs will continue. Uh, they will be different, uh, especially in the short term. Ideally, they will be more flexible and more uh, approachable in the long term as well. But the obstacles we're going to face are not primarily legal. They are practical. And the impact of pandemic illness on a global scale appears to be one of multiple surmountable obstacles as opposed to clear-cut legal obstacles. I thank you very much for your time. I hope that you have found this useful. Most of all, I would like to thank Dr. Smith for allowing me to investigate this topic. Uh, I think it is timely and potentially useful, not just for dealing with the pandemic, but for recognizing the kinds of challenges that can impact study abroad programs, even more than specific legal challenges in host or uh, uh, higher education provider nations. I want to thank all of my classmates who provided feedback, especially those in my international field study experience who consented to be interviewed or share, shared materials. And I want to thank all of you for your time today. Please stay safe, do good, and be well. Thank you.